starting the presentation now. And the first presentation is by a uh, dentist from Pangrai, Dr. Lori Brown. Please welcome. Good evening, everybody. Kia ora katoa. My name is Laurie Brett. I am, am a general practice dentist in Whangarei. I've practiced dentistry there for 35 years. And for all of that time, I have been a keen sort of amateur researcher of the chemistry of fluorine. And uh, I, was, I was staying in Parnell, actually, and I was walking up there in this beautiful day that we've had today, and I came across the Sir Dovemeyer Robinson Rose Park, and uh, I thought that was very relevant to my career as a dentist because it was Sir Dovemeyer Robinson, in fact, who alerted me to the uh, the whole debate about fluoridation of water supplies. Um, when I returned from my obligatory overseas travel experiences, uh, I noticed a, an article in the, in the paper uh, referring to a speech that he had made about a, a court case that had occurred in the United States of America where a, a jury, after one of the most protracted court cases in the history of the United States, had found that the incidence of cancer in, in an unfluoridated uh, communities, they would studied 10 large cities, was lower than the incidence of cancer in the fluoridated cities. Well, my professor of preventive dentistry at the University of Otago, uh, Professor Beck, printed a disclaimer in the, uh, in the Dominion newspaper saying that that wasn't true because certain criteria in the research processes hadn't been met and that actually that uh, was incorrect. Uh, it turns out that in fact the correct protocols had been followed in this case and that uh, I was very interested to see what the ins and outs of this argument was so I wrote a letter to both Professor Beck and uh, Sir Dovemeyer Robinson and uh, I received no reply from Professor Beck and I received a, a, a thing about this big of research data from Sir Dovemeyer Robinson and said read this and you'll know all about it so I did and uh, at that time he also said that I should contact uh, Dr John Colhoun who was the then principal dental officer for the Auckland region which, which is to say he was the sort of the, the head of dental service provision from the government point of view for the Auckland region. He was also the uh, spokesperson for the fluoridation sort of society or the, the New Zealand Dental Association uh, at that time. As, as part of that role, John Colhoun was uh, sent off around the world on a, on a tour of the fluoridated cities and countries to uh, sort of touch base with what was happening around the world and wherever he went, the, the people involved in the fluoridation programs came to him and said, hey, look, just quietly, it's not happening here, it's not changing, we're not seeing the benefit. So when he came back to Auckland, he had this huge database of all the school dental clinics uh, that provided him with uh, treatment records for the children, and he carried out a research program there. He actually had a PhD in, in this field, and was the honorary research fellow for Auckland University. So, and yes, what he found was that there was no statistical difference between fluoridated and non-fluoridated dentitions. He changed his view then and there and lost his career and his respect in the profession and, and uh, suffered terribly for his conviction. And I think we owe Sir Dovemeyer Robinson and John Colhoun a huge debt there for people who pursued the truth and found it and stuck to it. So there's my tribute to them. So I began practice in Whangarei and kept my sort of, in those days there was no internet, if you wanted to find out anything overseas you had to write a letter to the University of Prague or whatever and wait three months for a reply and you know it was a, a long slow process and it was a very lonely process too I might say. But uh, 
as I went on, the conviction grew in my mind that I was on to the right thing because in 1983, they uh, stopped fluoridation in Timaru. And there was a huge hue and cry then about the fact that there would be an epidemic of dental decay in Timaru. And they had a big media beat up about it. And uh, in fact, that, when was it? 1992. This was a headline in the, in the Timaru Hill. Dental decay soars in Timaru. Well, that is, was and is still a lie. The dental decay rates in Timaru after fluoridation stopped actually decreased at a rate greater than the surrounding fluoridated areas. So this is a kind of stuff that is going on. Tauranga ceased fluoridation in 1992, and again there was the same prediction of disastrous consequences, but there's been no word of a caries epidemic or a dental decay epidemic in Tauranga. Surely, if that had been the case, the Ministry of Health would have wasted no time in using that as a powerful tool to promote fluoridation in our communities. But they don't. And the reason? Because there hasn't been a change in the caries rates in these places once they stop fluoridating water. This is a case all over the world. All of Europe has stopped fluoridating water. Countries, Cuba, Finland, what was used to be East Germany, all took national legislative stages, steps to stop fluoridating, and their decay rates have not increased. Now, this is incontrovertible. I'd like to talk now a little bit about a review process that took place in the year 2000 called the York Review and the University of York in the United Kingdom uh, carried out the first sort of uh, com complete review of all research pertaining to water fluoridation. Uh, it, it had its limitations as, a, as, a, as a, a document, but it was actually a very objective attempt to come to some sort of conclusions about water fluoridation. The overall conclusions were that there may, and I repeat, may be a reduction in, fluoro, in decay in fluoridated communities, but that the research quality is so poor that you can't actually draw conclusions from it. And the reason for this is, is that, and New Zealand is a very good example of this sort of situation, is, is that you have data collected by fluoride uh, promoting school dental nurses. That same data is then processed by fluoride promoting dentists who are funded by fluoride promoting ministries of health. The sample sizes are small, there's no double blind testing. This renders this type of uh, research really meaningless. It's a waste of money to even start to do it. You need large-scale, unbiased studies, and there just aren't enough of them to draw a conclusion. Secondly, and I think this is really important, is that there has never been any research carried out by the promoters of fluorine in water to prove that it's safe. Not one research program. Now, what does that tell you? The third thing is, is that there is no proof of a specific socio-economic benefit. That is to say that the, the poor, the disadvantaged, do not show a particular additional benefit from having their water fluoridated. Now, this is particularly relevant in New Zealand because the, you'll hear it all the time that the claim is made by the Ministry of Health and the DHBs that the great thing about it is, is that it sort of levels the playing field for the, for the poor and the disadvantaged and that their teeth are going to be particularly well uh, uh, served by having the fluoride in their water. This is just the emotive propaganda. You know, we, we have to be aware of this. And speaking of emotive propaganda, we just look at... Uh, the recent debate here in, in Queensland, which has actually distanced itself completely from a, from a state legislated fluoridation program, which is hugely uh, progressive on their part, I'd have to say. Here we go. 
Townsville has 65% less tooth decay than non-fluoridated Brisbane. Now this is how we arrive at that 65%. You look at the DMF figures, which means decayed, missing, filled teeth. In other words, teeth that have been affected by tooth decay. In Townsville, the, the average tooth surface that's affected is a tiny amount, 0.09 of a surface. That is a very, very low incidence of decay. In Queensland, it's a whopping quarter of a tooth surface, a quarter of a tooth surface, and the difference, yes, is 65%. Let's trumpet that. But actually what it is, the absolute difference is 0.17 of one surface of one tooth. Now that is clinically and statistically absolutely meaningless, but it's used as advertising propaganda. Now see on our right here, that's the slide that they use to show the consequences of not having fluoride in your water. Well by that standard, everyone in my hometown of Far A should be walking around looking like Glenn Frankenstein, you know. <laughs> Move on to the next one, please. And this is the one they used at the Waikato District Health Board, put in there by a dentist. And there isn't a dentist in New Zealand who would look at that slide and say that that person is suffering dental decay because of a lack of fluoride in their water supply. That is baby bottle decay. And that happens when you put honey on the teat, baby's crying, plug it in, they go to sleep happily sucking on the honey and whatever, whatever's in the bottle. Whether there's fluoridated water in that bottle or not is absolutely meaningless. And the guy who put that picture in that flyer that the Waikato District Health Board used knew, knew that, but is prepared to, well, deceive the public. It's misleading advertising. Not good. What they put into the water supply for fluoridated Auckland amounts to as far as I can figure out, something like 1,500 tonnes a year of hydrofluorosilicic acid. A hydrofluorosilicic acid is the waste product of the fertiliser industry. It's obtained by putting water vapour into the chimneys of the fert works and that dribbles down and it's collected in a tank. It's contaminated with arsenic, cadmium, lead, all kinds of stuff depending on where the fertiliser ore is sourced from. That very same material is put into your, the, the tankers and is taken to your water supply system and tipped straight into it, unpurified, unaltered. Suddenly that category 8 toxic waste becomes good for you. I don't think so. Furthermore, only 1% of that water is actually drunk. The rest of it is released into the environment, largely into the waterways and the, the stormwater and stuff like that. And this is the what's called the MSDS, Material Safety Data Sheet for Hydrofluorosilicic Acid. And it says, do not allow material to enter sewer, stormwater drains or waterways. If spill may enter waterways, contact regional authority. Well, a regional authority are the people who are putting it in there in the first place. So <laughs> what you're doing is you're paying the Fert Works to put this stuff in your water, whereas it is actually illegal to put it into any other water source in New Zealand. This is just crazy. It's what I would call the supreme example of a blunt instrument in, uh, public health policy. If there's anything worse, I'd shudder to think what it is, but you know, really it's just out of date and it has to go. If there is any benefit from drinking fluoridated water, it is claimed that it is a topical effect. That is to say, it attaches itself to the surface of your tooth as you drink the water. Well, at 0.7 parts per million, the effect is likely to be negligible given that the pe same people who promote fluoridated water are promoting fluoridated toothpaste at a concentration of a thousand parts per million or more, saying that you have to actually scrub that in with your toothbrush and don't, don't uh, rinse your mouth out, spit it out and leave the residue in your mouth. And even that isn't powerful enough. They're saying 1,500 parts per million or even 3,000 parts per million to be effective. 
So the likelihood that 0.7 parts per million for that fleeting instant that it passes over your teeth is effective is just beyond the realms of logic to me. So you're drinking this stuff for no benefit. Toxicity. There's a pile that's high of research about the toxicity of fluorine, despite the fact that the Ministry of Health tells you there's no evidence of harm. What they're saying really there is, is that they haven't actually looked or they're not seeing the evidence of harm. That's not proof of safety. They're just not being they're just not aware or not crediting the research that's been done. We have effects on the pineal gland, which is an organ in your brain which, which moderates uh, things like your sleep patterns and the onset of puberty. We have your thyroid gland, which requires iodine to function properly. Well, iodine and fluorine compete against each other and fluorine wins, so you have a, an iodine deficit situation arise in your th thyroid gland function. Fluorine reacts brilliantly with calcium, so you're getting arthritic changes that uh, take place and the early signs of fluor fluorine poisoning are arthritic changes, painful joints and so on. In China there's been a, a large cohort of uh, research into IQ effects. In China the water wells and the villages are all endemically uh, polluted with fluorine, they have very high levels in some areas, and they've collated the concentrations in different villages with the, with the IQ testing, and they have a cause and effect relationship. Now this sounds very dramatic, I know, I'm not saying everyone who drinks fluorine is going to end up an idiot, but uh, I'm glad I don't drink it. <laughs> I think given that we, the burden of proof of, of safety doesn't lie with a vocal minority. The burden of proof of safety lies with the people who are promoting the medication. There's also an, an element to me, really, and it's one of the most important aspects of this whole debate, and that is that, and it's been diminished actually, and it's a deliberate plot, if you like, or a program to diminish it, and that is the, the ethics of the decision of an individual to choose not to have a medication. And they're saying it's not a medication, but I mean it's there to treat a, a, a disease. So what's been hap what's happening is, is that you're having the, your right to drink clean water taken away from you. Why is fluoride the only medicine, medicine in our water? If it's that good and it's such an effective medium of, of uh, treating disease, why not put a whole raft of medicines in there? Have a tap that you turn with a solid nutrient, just one tap does all. You know, let's let's eat the stuff, let's have everything in there. Why just fluoride? I don't believe that it's the council's responsibility to treat or to be responsible for treating a disease. If the council has enough on its plate to uh, keep itself busy with running a big city, this is a, a, a health department issue. If we're going to have fluoride in the water, it should be a nationally legislated thing and the responsibility should lie with the Ministry of Health. But they notoriously run for cover when it comes to saying that that should be done. And I don't think it will be done. So, yeah, here I rest my case. Finally, um, in New Plymouth, where we were able to convince the New Plymouth Council to remove fluorine from the water, and also in Waipukuro, where they also decided to take it out of the water, the Newspapers printed virtually the same articles um, once the decision had been made. They said the council has decided to remove fluorine from the water as of today. However, we will continue to fluoridate the water supply uh, until stocks are exhausted because there's no other safe way of disposing of it. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. Can I call to, can I call to start Thank you so much, Lorraine. This is amazing, isn't it?